All right, since uh, Steve, your PowerPoint's up first, we're gonna start with you. Just uh, you know, feel free to give a brief introduction to yourself and uh, have at it. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Representative Grove and, and delegation. Um, my name's Steve Bailey, I'm with the Pew Charitable Trust and I really appreciate your time. So I will try to give you back some time and give you a tweet level version of my presentation and you can always follow up with me later and I'm happy to come to Harrisburg. I'm from Pennsylvania and, and I love the state. So thank you so much. Um, and my colleague Barb spoke a little earlier, but uh, I work with the Pew Charitable Trust and we're really we're here to help you. We're, uh, we do custom analysis, research, uh, and we travel to states and we really help you implement the best policy for 100% free. So feel free to contact us at any time. And uh, what I'm here to talk about today is rainy day funds. Pew has five reports on rainy day funds, which I know what you're thinking, why not 10? Why not 15? But uh, for now, we just have five reports on rainy day funds. We cover anything from really when to save, how much to save, um, a lot of the stress testing work and volatility studies we've been directly involved in, and also when to take money out of the rainy day fund. And so a lot of the important issues that um, and states care about with rainy day funds we've studied over the last six years. Um, and so 48 states have rainy day funds in law. We focus on them because States have reserves in a lot of different pockets, but rainy day funds are that one fund that states have that is really designed to help guard against the recession and other one-time costs. So these are specific funds and they exist in 48 states. And uh, just so I got to get a pulse of the room, how many people would rather save instead of give money back to the taxpayer or spend it on an important program? No one, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's like taking your medicine for a lot of people. It's something you have to do or go into a fourth grader's band recital. It's something you probably should do, but you might not want to because uh, there's a lot of important priorities. And um, saving certainly is an opportunity cost. For each dollar saved is a dollar you can't spend on an important program. But um, what I want you to take away, if you take away one thing from my presentation today, it's that if you design a rainy day fund policy well, it can have so many more benefits from your state. You can help stabilize your budget over the long term. Um, it lessens the need for really bad program cuts or tax increases during bad times, obviously. And it just makes your revenue more predictable. Uh, you have a lot of important priorities and the last thing you want is in April to find out you don't have enough revenue and uh, not enough reserves to cover it. So it just makes your job a little easier. Um, and then, so I know a focus a lot today has been on pensions and OPEB and other priorities. And really, if you design a rainy day fund well, once a reserve is adequate, you can usually use these mechanisms to help fund other really important priorities. Uh, and finally, um, it helps enhance state credit ratings. So here is just a graph uh, really quick of uh, state credit rating uh, divided out by the percent of rainy day fund balance. And this is not to say that if you put a bunch of money in your rainy day fund, all of a sudden your credit rating will go up, but it's more of a reflection on that last slide that just when rainy day fund policy is sound, it reserves as a one credit rating agency said is a really a bellwether for um, for your financial health in general. And so um, when you put in place really good reserve policies, um, states um, generally see just better economic outcomes and better fiscal outcomes. Um, so really quick, I just wanna walk through the different ways states save and then spoil alert uh, the best practice we have at the bottom for how states should save. And so um, generally there are four broad categories of how states save to the rainy day fund. One is a surplus rule that just says if there's money left over, we're gonna save it. And I don't know if this is the case in Pennsylvania, but a lot of times if lawmakers realize there's a surplus, a lot of times that surplus can go away rather quickly. And so uh, surplus rules just make savings the last priority. Uh, there's forecast error rules. These are a little better. Uh, these are rules that say if revenue exceeds their forecast, we're gonna put some money away. Um, that's good because a lot of times when revenue exceeds its forecast, that the economy is doing well, but sometimes um, either Let's say you forecasted revenue would grow at 0% and it grew at 1%, might not be the best time to save. And other times, if you forecasted revenue to grow, you wouldn't be saving. There are some states that have static rules in place. This just means that they're required to have a certain balance or they're required to pay back their balance over a certain amount of time. This is really good for prioritizing savings, but sometimes it can make you pay back before your really economy is ready to start paying back. And secondly, sometimes the rules can be so strict you might be afraid to take money out of your rainy day fund. Uh, in Missouri, for example, during the Great Recession, they took out less than half a percent from their rainy day fund because they were so afraid of their repayment rule. Uh, so just something to be aware of there. Um, and really, rainy day funds in general, they're meant to be used. If you're not saving them but also drawing them down, then you're saving tax or unnecessarily hoarding some money. 
Um, and then finally, volatility rules. I'm going to explain what they are, and you're going to wonder why every state doesn't do this. When revenue is above normal, you save some money. And that's what volatility-based rules are. And you'd be shocked to know that only nine states did that prior to the Great Recession. And so I want to show you why these are the best rules. And so uh, this is an example of revenue volatility. This is the annual fluctuations of Pennsylvania's general fund revenue over the last 10 years. And so rainy day funds are really designed to smooth this volatility out. Of you. If you think about this like lines of sand, you're just trying to smooth that out. And so um, when you're building a volatility-based rule, you have to do two things. One, decide what it means to be what is above normal revenue. And two, figure out how much that above normal revenue you want to save. And so in Virginia, um, they have a rule, one of the oldest rules. It's been established since 1992. And these say when revenue exceeds its previous six-year growth average, they're going to set aside up to 50% of that revenue. So if you're looking at this graph here, that black line represents what that six-year moving average line would have been for Pennsylvania. And so well, the blue lines that go above that, money would be put aside and up to 50% in Virginia's rules case. There's other rules um, in Idaho. They just look across their history and they said, we think on average we grow at about 4% of our revenue and anything above that, we're going to set aside about 1% of that. And so um, of all the states, there's about 11 states that are looking at the general fund with these kind of rules. And so they're all a little different. But some states have gone a little further. Some states have said, we can handle some of our fluctuations, but there are fluctuations in especially volatile tax sources that we want to smooth out in this way. And that's some other states are looking at, so this is Pennsylvania's uh, different taxes broken out by some components. You see corporate income, selective sales, sales and use, um, and personal income tax, all to say there's a lot of volatile tax streams out there and um, maybe you can deal with sales tax fluctuations, but you might want to set aside some of your more volatile ones. Uh, in Oklahoma, for example, in addition to saving their uh, oil and gas tax, when it goes above normal, they're also setting aside their corporate income tax. And then separately, um, a lot of states have realized that not just are there different volatile components of the general fund, but different taxes have different, uh, different taxes themselves have different components of volatility. So in Pennsylvania's uh, personal income tax, you have the withholding portion, which is that very stable blue line. This is the amount that comes out of the paycheck. And then this has been the 10 year fluctuations of the non withholding portion of personal income. And so um, for states like Connecticut, Maryland, Virginia, um, California, uh, they've looked at, wait, Massachusetts, they have uh, decided to set aside just kind of this non withholding portion, the portion that's more tied to capital gains in the stock market. And again, they're just identifying periods when revenue is spiking, so it's there when revenue drops below normal. And so I said nine states were doing this before the Great Recession uh, in some way, and now we're up to 21 states, which is really impressive, and it makes sense. State revenues are getting more volatile, as you've heard, and a lot more states are looking at ways that they can set aside some of these revenue spikes so they're there for the valley. And if you were my mom, you would say, well, just because Nebraska jumped off a bridge, would you do it? Uh, which I'd have some smart Alec comment for. But it's true, all of these states are different. Um, and of all these 21 rules, they're all doing it in a slightly different way. Um, and the good thing is, is once you've established this framework, once you've identified how you're gonna decide what's above normal and how you're gonna set that aside, once your rainy day fund reaches an adequate level, which you can tell through things like the stress test that uh, representative you asked about um, and other means, once you've figured out what your adequate number is, once that rainy day fund reaches that number, you can use um, these same methods to identify non-recurring one-time revenue and set that aside. There's a lot of states that are using it for capital projects to pay down unfunded liabilities, uh, to refinance their debt, or for temporary uh, tax reductions or program enhancements. And so there's a lot you can do once you've figured out your framework for what is above normal revenue. Um, and the last thing I would say, Pew can help. We've helped, uh, of the nine states that have implemented deposit rule changes since 2012, we've been directly involved in helping 12 of those states do that. Uh, and then separately, we've helped states figure out some of those other questions, such as um, how much to save and when to take money out. And so um, if any of this interested you and you'd just like a free conversation, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Again, my name's Steve Bailey, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Bill, uh, follow up with the rainy day. We'll get your PowerPoint up there. Well, why don't I start and give you a, give you a break while, or shall we wait for the 
wait for the next slide to, to, to come up. Yes, where's, we need Jordan. Thank you. I'm, I'm, thank you, Steve. I'm glad to say the Pew is now in 13 states. So helping. <laughs> so thank, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, committee members. Uh, once again, there's some boilerplate in here that we reviewed earlier, so we can we can skip through that quickly. So uh, we just published a, a a new working paper last uh, last month called Rainy Day Fund Strategies: uh, A Call to Action, and it focuses on the need, uh, the need, and the how to do it for for rainy day funds, much much as Steve and his colleagues at Pew uh, Pew have done. Um, rainy day funds are one of several reserves that that states cash reserves that that states keep. Um, in many states, uh, there's also a uh, there's also a general fund reserve uh, or a general fund balance at the end of the year or the beginning of the year. Some states can carry a balance over. Some states don't. Colorado uh, uses its uh, uses its general fund balance as a rainy day fund. They're one and the same. Um, and there are additional pots of cash that states often use as reserves. Um, as previous speaker in, uh, in Utah pointed out, these are one-time actions and something you have to look out for. But uh, in Illinois, um, there, is no, there is no reserve effectively, although they have rules on the books about it. Uh, so Illinois uh, uses uh, fund sweeps from cash uh, all over the balance sheet, sometimes 500 sweeps in a, in a, uh, at a year end. Uh, Illinois also doesn't pay its bills and so uses its, uses its vendors uh, as a source of reserve to the tune of sometimes $14 billion. It's not a, it's not a policy I would recommend, and in many states, uh, in many states it's, uh, it's forbidden. So rainy day funds are part of, a, part of an overall cash management strategy, but rainy day funds often come with, uh, come with rules, and the most clear ones are, are policies for deposits and withdrawals, and I'll, I'll go into that because these are, these are very special funds. So how are we doing on rainy day funds? Nationally, uh, nationally we're, we're doing great. Not, we, it's just about, just about the best we've ever been um, as a percentage of, uh, as a percentage of uh, general fund spending. It's, it's uh, about 10% of 10% uh, of state revenues with tremendous variance. Some states have nothing, still have nothing in reserve like Illinois. Uh, despite this uh, amazing uh, recovery, some states have 10 to 20 percent or, or more in reserve. Um, Alaska is a is a very special case. I can get to that in a second. Um, in in dollar terms, this is in current dollars. Um, states are up to over 60 billion. It's actually actually it's closer to 68 billion dollars in in rainy day funds. So that's that's certainly the most ever, and you can see how things have improved since the uh, since the two recessions we had, uh, which are in gray. Uh, so we're doing great. Pennsylvania, amazing. Uh, Pennsylvania actually put $317 million into the kitty after $22 million the year before. Uh, the governor and the legislature are to be commended for that uh, because you're finally saying we need a buffer against, uh, against another downturn. So this is very important. Other stress states are doing it too. This is, this is a testimony both to political will, which it takes, and the, and the state of the economy. Uh, Phil Murphy just put in uh, more than expected a $401 million deposit into the Rainy Day Fund. We've been beaten up on Jersey for five years at the Volcker Alliance for not only having nothing in the Rainy Day Fund, but in some years uh, having nothing in the general fund balance. Um, which is, which is in actually one year, New Jersey borrowed about $200 million to start out the year. States can do this. Arizona, at the depth of the recession, was, was uh, managing an $800 million overnight, uh, overnight letter of credit with uh, Bank of America, done by competitive bidding, but there was a, there was a cost to that. Uh, Arizona had uh, already sold its, uh, sold its 
They sold everything, including the state house, everything but, but death row. So Arizona had no reserves and was operating on, on short-term borrowed money. Don't ever go there because it's, it's really not sustainable. Uh, Connecticut, another state with tremendous, tremendous fiscal problems uh, and a extremely intractable pension problem, which they've solved by continually pushing out the, uh, the amortization, uh, the, the date of full amortization of their unfunded balance. Connecticut makes its pension arc, but it's decided to put money into reserves uh, and it's tied it to volatility. So Connecticut's headed for two, two billion dollars plus, which will make, uh, which will make uh, for very important, uh, very important stability because Connecticut is a high income tax state, progressive state with a lot of high income earners. Come the next downturn, they'll be hurt. Uh, so how are we doing? We went through this earlier. There's a lot of green on that map because the economy is, is doing well. Um, Kansas is a, is a particularly stressed, stressed state. Illinois has about, has about two minutes in, uh, in, in reserves right now. So they're living by their wits. But generally states are, are doing pretty well and, and Pennsylvania is coming along. Um, in the, in the report we did, we looked at some statutes, uh, statutes and practices, because uh, we, want, we want this to be a toolkit uh, for states that, uh, that might want to study how other states are doing with some best practices. So number one, and I'll get to Pennsylvania in a second on what you do and, and don't do, but number one, withdrawal policies are very important. There's 43 states have, have some kind of a withdrawal policy. This prevents uh, frivolous use, this, this prevents uh, um, doing what uh, New York does, which is uh, using the rainy, using cash on the balance sheet and the rainy day fund really as a, as a source of one-time fixes. Uh, New York has statutorily is allowed to keep up to 5% of general fund revenues uh, in the rainy day fund. Uh, currently it's about two and that's what New York has been running for many years. Um, two states, so just to go back there, so on withdrawal policies, we, 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 hided, we highlighted Indiana, uh, because Indiana is an exemplar in many budget practices, but this is worth, worth noting. Um, replenishment rules. When you take the money out, what, you know, what's going to happen? It, is this an internal loan? What do you, you, you want to make sure the money is put back in. Uh, only two states lack replenish, re replenishment statutes, so this is, this is very encouraging. Um, some states have actually strengthened this. Uh, Georgia, for example, uh, had a policy that you keep 10% of your general fund revenue in the rainy day fund. They spent their rainy day fund in one and a half budgets during the last recession. That prompted Jack Hill, who many of you know, uh, the, the Senate finance chairman, to unusually uh, for him write a piece of legislation calling for a 15% balance. Uh, Georgia has now rebuilt their rainy day fund from essentially zero to 12% as, uh, as of Monday when I checked. Uh, and they're, they're clearly headed for the 15% goal. Um, there's a lot of talk here t this afternoon about linking rainy day funds to revenue volatility. The question is how you do it. Uh, so Utah does it with stress tests. Uh, Minnesota is a very I interesting example. A lot of people want to highlight California, which, uh, which baked the volatility tie into the Constitution by, um, by referendum. Uh, Minnesota uses an economic formula uh, so they look at the economy and the state of revenue in setting, uh, in setting a goal for, for revenue volatility. Like all of these, we have the, the statutory citation below if anybody wants to refer to them. Um, and that gets, us to, that gets us to the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, in our report card, let's look at the things we, uh, we highlighted as far as your reserve funds policy. So Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania got a C uh, for reserve fund policies. We graded on a scale of A to D minus. So it, 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 C is it's it's not a failing grade. It's it's kind of kind of not great. Um, so you had it you had a, a, a deteriorating rainy day fund and general fund balance over the period. Uh, but you do have a disbursement policy. You do have a replenishment policy. I'll get to that in a second. You don't have a volatility tie. So that's, that's left you with a, a poorish grade. I think that if the rainy day fund contributions continue, the grade here will probably pick up, but uh, we won't be getting to fiscal 2020 for a while yet. Um, let's look at, at Pennsylvania, um, at what Pennsylvania actually does. So the withdrawals, uh, 
Pennsylvania actually has a very strong set of withdrawal policies, revenue shortfall, if there's an economic downturn, a health safety emergency, uh, and a supermajority required for some spending. So you've got safeguards. It's interesting that North Carolina, after a hurricane uh, in 2017, um, used, the, uh, used the rainy day fund to bridge the gap between uh, what it was laying out for emergency services and what it was going to get for FEMA. Uh, so this, this is, these are very important, these rules. Replenishment, not so great. Um, if you have a surplus, some of it goes into the rainy day fund. Other states, uh, other states may use a dedicated funding source. We, we heard that Utah does that. Um, there, are, there are irregular funding sources. Revenue above estimate, not necessarily a surplus. A funding formula, which California uses, uh, and a defined replenishment period. That's a very important thing because to me, a rainy day fund expenditure is kind of like an interagency inter loan. Uh, when California set its, its new rainy day fund policy in 2014, um, they, uh, they, they specified that before the money went into the rainy day fund, in intergovernmental loans had to be paid off. Uh, New York has used intergovernmental loans to pay, uh, to pay pension contributions. Uh, it's an IOU. So, you, so this, is, this is a very important point because uh, debt, debt is debt whether you owe it to yourself or you owe it to the taxpayer. Uh, lastly, about credit ratings, um, Pennsylvania, it, the, the blue line is, is, where the, um, is where our top rating and the credit ratings uh, um, uh, coincide. So along that blue line, you see a bunch of A-rated states uh, on our grades and AAA-rated states on, on S&P. Pennsylvania is, Pennsylvania's got a, a C grade for reserves and an A-plus from S&P. Um, probably means you're actually punching a little bit above your weight. Um, you could see that um, improving your reserve grade might actually help your, uh, your credit rating. Um, you can see that also New Jersey, uh, New Jersey with a, B, with a B grade from the Volcker Alliance is, is probably, um, uh, probably is, is rated a little better than it might otherwise be. We'll see what happens with their reserves. But I think this is a strong statement that reserves do play a role in credit ratings. Um, opportunity cost is, is there. Maryland keeps a very high cash reserve uh, and is very, very devoted to its AAA. The same goes for, for Virginia and for Georgia. It's, a, it's part of the political culture. So I think the rainy day funds are important, not just as a savings mechanism and safety valve, but also uh, to help pres preserve your, uh, your lowest credit costs. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. And if we have any questions, um, fire away later. Awesome. We'll come back for questions, panel. Uh, we'll head into the last panel, um, panel six on economic strategies to improve uh, Pennsylvania moving forward. We'll start with uh, Ashley. Thanks so much, Ashley. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. As mentioned, my name is Ashley Klingensmith. I am the Pennsylvania State Director of Americans for Prosperity. And for those unfamiliar with AFP, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan grassroots advocacy organization that engages in many of the important policy questions that we face today. And our perspective on these issues is always one of removing the barriers that prevent individuals from earning their own success, contributing to their communities, and living a life full of dignity and personal fulfillment. So it should come as no surprise that when we were asked to speak regarding our state's economic growth, the first question that came to my mind was, how do our current policies affect Pennsylvanians' ability to build their own success and act as an engine of growth for our state at large? And so the answer really comes down to a few primary categories of policy um, that we can dive into. But before that, I just want to start with one caveat. Our state economy is massive and endlessly complex. It's beyond any one of us to direct it to achieve optimal growth. But what we can do is create conditions and an environment for success and trust that Pennsylvanians will take hold of these opportunities to do something truly special that will benefit us all. So that being said, there are three things that have an outsized effect on economic growth in any state. The tax climate, the regulatory climate, and employment policies. So tax climate. Pennsylvania has the 34th best business tax climate in the country, according to the Tax Foundation. 
And while that's not, you know, not by far the worst, it is below average, and I think we can do better. Um, among the taxes affecting businesses and economic growth is the corporate income tax. In PA, we have a corporate net income tax flat rate of 9.99%, um, one of the highest in the country. And why does that matter? Well, research has found that corporate tax rates have a strong effect on business formation in a state. When a state cuts its corporate income tax by one percentage point, it sees a three to 4% increase in the number of business establishments. And so corporate tax increases are similarly associated with slower economic growth. Beyond just rates, we should be looking at the structure of our tax system at large. A massive amount of capital is tied up in compliance costs for an overly complex tax structure. Such complexities create unnecessary economic inefficiencies that have nothing to do with the task of collecting revenues to fund the essential services we need and expect from our government. It's estimated that the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, by simplifying the code, could result in compliance savings ranging from $3.1 billion to $5.4 billion nationwide. PA can and should mirror these streamlining efforts in our own code. Not only will reductions in rates free up capital for further investment, but compliance savings can similarly be used to expand businesses, create new jobs, and raise wages in an increasingly competitive labor market. There's also another element to streamlining the code that will reap major benefits for economic growth, the elimination of targeted deductions and tax credits to favored businesses. Targeted economic development incentives often referred to as corporate welfare, distort markets and have failed to yield long-term economic growth time and time again. As the recent Amazon HQ2 battle demonstrated, it is only too easy to convince well-meaning lawmakers to mortgage the state's finances in the pursuit of economic development. And the irony is that these incentives are not even a primary factor for most businesses when deciding where to locate. Factors such as the presence of a skilled workforce, cost of living, infrastructure, and an accessible consumer marketplace are all more important to businesses. It is estimated that at least 75% of firms that receive some form of tax incentive would have made a similar decision regarding their facility locations and personnel without the incentive. So with the money our state spends on special tax treatment for a favored few, we could reduce the overall rates and address many of these more important factors to economic growth. The average known state subsidy bid for Amazon HQ2 was $6.75 billion. For that amount, PA could reduce its corporate income tax rate by 10.78%, fund nearly 17,000 four-year college scholarships for PA students, or fully fund the statewide road maintenance for four years. To me, any of these options would yield greater long-term growth and a more dynamic economy than offering the funding to one private corporation on a silver platter. In fact, if PA eliminated all of the favorable tax incentives it already supplies, we could reduce, reduce our corporate income tax rate by 6.1%. And so, regulatory environment. Um, tax policy, uh, well, we'll just start. A disproportionate regulatory burden, one that reaches uh, beyond basic public health and safety concerns, presents a barrier to entry into the marketplace that many would-be entrepreneurs and job creators simply can't overcome. In fact, a 10% um, increase in the intensity of regulation leads to a statistically significant decrease in the number of new businesses getting started, as well as a significant decrease in hiring among all firms, old, new, small, large. So with so many jobs on the line, it's imperative that we get the balance right when it comes to regulatory policy. Yet, the PA code is prohibitively large and difficult to fully understand. The code contains 153,661 restrictions, 12.8 million words, and would take 18 weeks to read through if a person read 300 words per minute for 40 hours a week. It's a lot to ask of anyone 
to know when they are or are not in compliance with such a large document and that does not even include federal and local regulations. This is why we need bipartisan evidence-based approach to crafting and managing regulations as well as sunsetting the obsolete regulations. And so models have begun to pop up around the country for such reforms. Most involve a powerful combination of one of four activities. Counting the number, size, and severity of all state regulations, capping the cumulative size of the state regulatory burden, working with the rule, making agencies themselves to understand which rules are duplicative or obsolete and can therefore be cut, and which regulations need to be updated or streamlined to make compliance easier. And last, establishing an analysis unit to evaluate the potential economic impacts of various regulations and responsibly weighing them against the benefits to public health and safety. Similar bipartisan legislation, as many of you know, has already been introduced here. We have House Bill 995 with 24 sponsors, and um, we are grateful for those of you who, who have signed on. Um, and that would establish a pilot program with certain agencies requiring them to count their regulations and compliance costs, cap them, and propose cuts to equal 25% of their total regulatory burden. That type of innovation could truly unleash the economic potential of small businesses in our state, many of whom are disproportionately affected by regulatory compliance burdens. Employment policy. Um, as I move into the final category, there is a very important issue that straddles both employment policy and the regulatory barriers just discussed, and that issue is occupational licensing. If you're not familiar with this type of uh, regulation, it's essentially a requirement that someone obtain permission directly from the government before practicing in a certain field. And so unlike other types of regulation, like registration or inspections or sanctions, which provide a structure for monitoring the quality of a good or service and providing consequences if a professional jeopardizes the health and safety of another, Occupational licensure does not allow a person to practice their trade at all until they meet the state's often onerous requirements to maintain a license. There's a large body of research detailing how ineffective occupational licensure is as a means to protect public safety and health and even to ensure quality. One of the best recent examples of this is an excellent report put out by the Obama administration. Their review of the existing literature on this subject found that stricter licensing was associated with quality improvements in only two of 12 studies reviewed. There is also evidence that many licensing boards are not diligent in monitoring licensed practitioners, which contributes to a lack of quality improvement under licensing. These boards often rely on um, consumer complaints and third-party reports to monitor practitioner quality, but only a small fraction of consumer complaints result in any kind of disciplinary action. So if this regulatory framework is not efficient at enforcing quality standards, why allow it to get in the way of individuals just trying to make a living and get ahead? When it comes to occupational licensing, PA is considered to have less onerous regulations than many other states, but this is not a good way to judge our state because even the best states relative to others are in need of significant reform to increase employment opportunities and consumer access. There are also a number of low to moderate income occupations, PA licenses that many other states do not, including upholsters, weighers, taxidermists and auctioneers. For that last one, we require 140 days of education time to get licensed, while in the meantime, we have highly competent EMTs who serve the public with only 35 days of education time needed to get licensed. It seems that even in PA, we still have some work to do on this front. With um, almost 20% of our workforce requiring permission from the government to do work, one study estimates that each year licensing costs us over 89,000 jobs. That's $368 million in dead weight economic losses and over $9.4 billion in misallocated economic resources, which represents people spending money where they would not have 
if only Pennsylvania's licensing laws weren't creating harmful barriers to access. Last, I'd just like to take um, a moment to talk about public sector workers and their contributions to our state's economy. In the fiscal year 2014, the state employed 161,369 employees, with localities employing an additional 400,000 or so. State employee payroll accounted for nearly $800 million per month, with state and local employee payroll taken together it was just over $2.6 billion per month. Ideally, these public employees should have full command of their salaries. These dollars should be theirs to save, invest, or spend as they see fit, providing valuable investment dollars in economic ac activity. Yet many workers do not fully understand their rights um, to their own salaries as outlined in the landmark Janus versus AFSCME Supreme Court ruling passed down just a year ago. Based on that ruling, all public employees have certain rights and we're calling those Janus rights. Chief among them is that they cannot be compelled to have public sector union dues deducted from their paychecks as a condition of their employment. While this ruling was certainly a contentious one, the good news for our state's economy is that these dollars are now free for public employees, employees to direct how they wish, whether that be to a union uh, activity or not. So simply by having the choice of how to spend this additional portion of their salaries, market forces will work better and we will all benefit. The now voluntary nature of union membership for our public servants helps ensure that the relationship between workers, government unions, and government as an employer are more mutually beneficial. That's one reason we've been supporting Representative Klunk's House Bill 785, which notifies workers of their rights under the Janus ruling, rights they were never entitled to for decades in our state that many still do not fully re realize. And so it's the duty of our government to honor the U.S. Constitution and ensure our public workers are able to exercise their First Amendment rights. So since my time's winding down, I'd just like to conclude with a few final thoughts. I hope everyone comes away from this with a message of optimism. There's a lot of things that are going well and many more that are within our reach to improve. But as we continue the discussion regarding the best ways to grow the economy, if nothing else, I just want to encourage all of us as a community of policymakers, activists, and advocates to focus on solutions that are accessible to all Pennsylvanians, not just those who have particular connections or work in a certain favored industry. None of us know what the future holds, and there are likely a lot of great employment and investment opportunities on the horizon. Rather than trying to anticipate what those opportunities will be, we can prepare our policy landscape such that every Pennsylvanian will be able to take advantage of those opportunities when they arrive. Thank you. Jared, thank you for coming up. You need It's good to be with you this afternoon. I'm Jared Walczak with the Tax Foundation. I've had the opportunity to uh, come up and present a number of times to state legislators um, in meetings like this and in the Capitol. So it's always good to be back. I'm going to keep this um, fairly brief, especially given the time, but just uh, bring up a few quick points uh, with regard to this topic um, of economic growth strategy, specifically on taxation. Do we have a clicker? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and you've already heard a lot today. You've heard about, uh, in the last presentation, the corporate income tax rate. That's obviously a significant point. Uh, Pennsylvania has the second highest, cor third highest corporate income tax rate in the nation. You had second for a long time. Um, it was 11.99 for many years, 11.99 because Iowa was 12, and it was a perfect bargain to only have 11.99, so you set it there. Then it was reduced in stages to 9.99, and it's been there for quite some time. That had been second. Um, 
New Jersey decided that they'd like to go a little higher, but Iowa's reducing, so you'll be back to second highest in a few years. Uh, that's a big deal. It definitely increases the cost of capital in Pennsylvania, and it's something that needs to be addressed. What I want to focus on to the extent that I'm talking about corporate taxes, though, is talking about some of the structural aspects very, very briefly, because if you have a high rate, structure matters significantly more. Um, I'm also going to talk about a couple of other provisions that are um, you know, outside of that. Uh, not necessarily easy things, but things that you've heard before and still probably worth a quick reminder. Uh, the first, and I apologize for the quality or the lack of quality of the maps. Usually we have a graphic designer who does great maps and they look great. And um, he was out yesterday and I put these together in Excel. So they're, they're my maps and those are not high quality maps. But hopefully you can at least get the point. Um, you know, we, we now have about 20 states that have um, cost recovery built into their tax codes, in many cases similarly to what the federal government does. So, of course, um, a corporate income tax, you put it in the name in Pennsylvania, it's a corporate net income tax. It's supposed to be on profitability, and we run into this fundamental, a couple of fundamental problems here. One, we'll get into in a minute, is that a single year snapshot is not a perfect way to measure uh, corporate profitability, and that goes to net operating losses. And two, there are a variety of expenses that for accounting purposes, we don't book to a single year, but are in fact expenses that a business incurs in a single year. So when businesses make um, some sort of investment in capital, uh, at the federal level, for many years, you had bonus depreciation. At 30 or 50 percent, you could take a significant portion of the investment costs for um, you know, machinery and equipment in the first year so that it wasn't something that you essentially provided a free loan to state and federal government for. Uh, the federal government, at least on a temporary basis, has increased that to 100%, what's often called full expensing. And many states have followed this. This is a pro-investment strategy. It is probably the most pro-investment aspect of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So there's all kinds of disagreements on a variety of provisions of the uh, TCJA. And some of them are pro-investment, some of them perhaps less so. This is a very pro-investment piece of it. And you can see a lot of states have followed. The darker blue is those that have um, gone with 100% full expensing. The two states you see, um, you know, Minnesota and North Carolina, um, have done partial. They don't have 100%, but they do have bonus depreciation above and beyond the traditional maker's schedule. So you're with the majority of states, but you're not in the leading edge of states. There are about 20 states that are doing it better. And of course, almost all of the states on this map have lower corporate income tax rates. So you are dramatically increasing the cost of investment. It's something potentially to explore. Uh, Pennsylvania briefly went very much in the other direction. After the enactment of the uh, TCJA, the um, Department of Revenue issued a bulletin in which they stated that you would completely decouple from all of this, including makers. There would be no depreciation schedule whatsoever due to an unusual way the statute was written. Thankfully, the legislature on a bipartisan, I think close to, if not completely unanimous basis, reversed that. But there's work to be done. Uh, I think there's an opportunity. Maybe you can get to 100%, maybe it's 50, which was the old standard. But can you have some sort of accelerated cost recovery beyond makers be a way to at least reduce some of the expenses of a very high corporate rate? The second aspect is those carry forwards. There's a lot of different ways to measure and note carry forwards um, because there's a couple of different aspects of this. And this again, of course, is when you have um, when you have profits and losses in different years. When you have losses, can you carry those forward to multiple years so you can get to an average of profitability and you're paying on your net profits? Uh, every state with a corporate income tax has net operating loss provisions. The federal government also has them. Uh, they used to be two-year carrybacks, 20-year carry forwards for the federal government. Um, and the, the switch with TCGA was to eliminate the carry back provision. Unlimited years of carry forward, but an 80% cap on how much you could take in a given year, meaning that you could only reduce your tax liability by 80%. Um, before that, that didn't really exist in most states. Rhode Island and Pennsylvania were the only states to have caps of that sort. Now a decent number of states, those that are in sort of the mid-blue shade, follow the federal government. Unlimited carry forwards, 80% cap, which is still pretty generous. Most, most states, most companies rather, um, they're not going to reduce more by more than 80% anyways. Pennsylvania, however, is in a different boat. Um, you offer 40% you can only reduce by 40%, and that you're actually catching a lot of companies that have a highly cyclical business cycle. Um, you know, a lot of your manufacturing businesses, your energy sector, 
they can have significant losses in one year, significant gains in another, and they can't smooth this the way that many of their competitors can in other states or other industries can here in Pennsylvania because of that 40% cap. This is driven partially by a court ruling. You used to have the, um, an alternative. It was either a dollar cap or a percentage cap. Now it has consolidated on a percentage cap. Uh, but it's still a very, very low cap. And I know that there's been, I think, bipartisan interest in raising it. It's, there's a revenue cost associated with doing that. Much of it's a timing effect, but not all of it. NOLs are usually almost purely timing effects, but this cap is actually preventing companies from ever taking uh, this adjustment in many cases. So there's revenue associated with it. I can't t prevent it. There's no cost, but you're uniquely um, harming capital investment through this, you, and you're uniquely hurting businesses that have longer business cycles in a way that, as you can see, um, other states really don't do. You can 80% is pretty good, so those mid-range states, I wouldn't worry about them too much. It's you and um, yeah, Connecticut now, actually, um, and that's it. And yeah, I don't think it's good. I mean, if you look at Connecticut's current uh, fiscal state, when it's just you in Connecticut, that's usually not a terribly good sign. Another thing I want to talk about, I know it is a very tough thing to talk about for us yeah, at the state level, but something needs to be done. Something, there needs to be a, a way to address property taxes. And I've sometimes been asked, don't even talk about property taxes, but I want to briefly, briefly talk about property taxes. Usually you hear this in the context of a discussion, what do we do about the high rates? What do we do about just the public discontent? And those are all really important issues, and I've testified at length on those. I don't want to talk about those today. What I do want to say is that you have a system that is terribly outdated. Um, Blair County, they did a reassessment in 2016. The previous one was in 1958. Now, 1958 was a little different. Back then, we were uh, having this big public debate about whether to take the subarctic tundra and turn it into a US state. We'd never have those sort of conversations today. Um, but a lot really has changed since we have uh, you know, reassessed in a lot of counties. My county, I grew up in Butler, Pennsylvania. Um, Butler County reassessed in 1964. There are a lot of counties that are still 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, some in the 90s, and of course a few that have done so fairly recently. The challenge, of course, yes, I mean, you, you're, they're supposed to essentially use the old figure. So if you do a reassessment of a property now, you essentially backcast it and you put it into 1964 terms or whatever the case may be. That is really difficult to do, so there's an error margin. But more importantly, the, without some sort of regularized assessment cycle, what you ultimately have to do is only reassess when someone significantly alters the property. Uh, selling it does not trigger a reassessment in Pennsylvania. That's pretty rare. There's no regular cycle. That's really rare. The only ways that you usually trigger it is subdividing a property, significantly improving that property. And it's $2,500, which doesn't sound significant, but it's $2,500 in the year of value. So it's 2,500 in uh, 1964 terms in Butler, Pennsylvania, which is a lot more than 2,500 in uh, 2019 terms. Um, or you know these these big alterations for some areas where the economy has grown, where property is significantly more valuable now, it is not in your best interest to improve your property because that will trigger a significant reassessment. And yes, you put it back into those old year terms, but you still capture all of this value that for decades has not been captured. So you don't subdivide the land and sell it when you probably should. You don't improve it when you could. And these things are a drag on your economy that are entirely based on the fact that you are the outlier, really the only significant outlier on not having some sort of regular assessments. Now there are nine states that don't have built into their constitution an assessment cycle, 41 do. Um, but you're the only one that hasn't figured out that even without a constitutional provision, you should probably do this on a fairly regular basis. Uh, the incentive for counties is never to do it unless a court obligates them to. That's a bad system. I know it's not easy to phase into this, but it's a problem when, you know, Allegheny County did it just a couple of years ago because the courts told them to, but you move over to, you know, um, yeah, you know, Warren County or something like that, and it, that's Moreland, and it's decades old. That's a problem. Um, and that segues into other local taxes. Pennsylvania has more local taxes than almost 
any state. Um, there are a few others that are like this, but this is a partial list, not a complete list, but you've got the earned income tax, the per capita tax, the mercantile and business privilege tax, the assessed occupation tax or the occupation tax, thankfully not both, the local services tax in uh, two counties, the sales tax, and the list actually goes on. And what's more, and this is really unusual, many of these taxes are collected by local elected tax collectors, some of whom are really good and are very professional, and some I've met, they're great people, but they do it on a legal pad because they might be a township tax collector because townships can actually in some cases be collecting some of these taxes. That doesn't exist in most states. Townships don't collect taxes. Boroughs don't collect taxes. Um, cities do, counties do, and that's about it. And Act 32 years ago did consolidate some of these taxes at the county level, but it didn't consolidate all of them. To me, that's a first step. Many states, actually, the, the state government takes care of more of these than Pennsylvania does, like local income taxes or local sales taxes handled by the state. I'm not suggesting that. Uh, but I do think that counties, which have the professional staff, could do this, which is good for the county. It's good for you know, using local resources wisely. But it's also very good for taxpayers. Because if you owe a mercantile or business privilege tax in some jurisdictions, you have to call and ask for them to fax you over the rate information, but it's not published anywhere. It's not widely available. That makes it hard to do business. And it also means lower collections because there's a lot of noncompliance that's not intentional, it's not fraud. It's small business owners who have never heard of this tax, who don't know they have a local tax collector that could be collecting. I mean, who's paying their assessed occupation tax? I'm guessing it's not nearly as many people as have scheduled occupations in those jurisdictions. Uh, some of these should just disappear. Why are we assessing occupations? If you want to know the value of an occupation, that's called income. To instead say the value of this occupation is set by an assessor who determines what the median amount that someone in this profession should make, it's discriminatory. You know, legal aid attorney and partner in a law firm pay the same. Uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But it's also just difficult to do. Uh, some of these could be eliminated, consolidated, $5 per capita tax you probably spend as much money um, collecting it as you do actually receive from it. In some cases, local services tax is 52 bucks or even more, but in some cases it's 10. Um, you're not getting a whole lot out of those. I get the purpose. You're collecting where someone works. There are ways to probably um, eliminate some of these, uh, consolidate others with the collections. Um, and honestly, it's an earned income tax, so it's a different base than the actual state income tax. <sighs> You know, I know it's easier said than done, but what if you just had the same base, a broader base that the state uses, and you got rid of everything else on that list? Um, localities would be made whole or more. They could adjust their rates downward, probably, in fact, to you know, achieve the same revenue, and you get rid of all of this menu that's so difficult for people to comply with and so costly. I know it's not easy to do, but very few um, states have something like this, and then you make it more complex because there are, I'm trying to remember, um, eight classes of counties, I believe, which five, with five different county codes. Um, obviously, um, there's two different classes of townships. Boroughs can have an optional election. And you get different tax codes for these. And they're not that different, but if you're a business property owner, say, who has property in uh, eight, ten counties, you might have four different, slightly different types of tax codes to work with. So you can't just cut and paste. No one else has this. I mean, almost. I think Louisiana does. Don't be like Louisiana. Uh, this is not really how you want to do this. Um, yet that should be consolidated and simplified. There's no reason for there to be five. There's probably not any reason for there to be more than one property tax code. Uh, so I would just encourage, look at those. I know it is not easy to do local tax reform, but this isn't even a revenue question. This is just a simplification question, and it makes your economy grow faster because businesses should be focusing on what they're doing, they know how to do, which is their core business, hopefully returning um, profits for their owners and their investors. It shouldn't be complying with outdated mercantile business taxes, assessed occupation taxes, or anything else on this list. Uh, so that's actually all I have. I'm going to keep it very brief given that we are running short on time, but at the end, happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jared. Andrew. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you again. I'm Andrew Abramchek, policy analyst at the Commonwealth Foundation. Um, and it's very good that your uh, delegation sees the importance of this issue, increasing economic growth. I'm well aware that I'm the last to speak on a summer afternoon after a big lunch ahead of a weekend, so I've tailored my remarks to that. Um, since 2000, the U.S. has grown at an average rate of 2.1 percent 
while Pennsylvania has grown at a rate of 1.6 percent annually. And of course, as you know, um, averages often hide more than they show. Um, if the state on average is lagging behind the nation, then big parts of our state are even lagging further behind, while a few very dynamic areas pull the load. Uh, this situation can be fixed, though, and we at the Commonwealth Foundation actually think the solutions are quite simple. Um, let me give you a bit of good news. Uh, just this month, the um, market news service, uh, Bloomberg, uh, ranked the 50 states on what it called economic diversity, the variety and balance of industries in each state. And Pennsylvania ranked number one. Everyone else has their list of 50 states and Pennsylvania being near the bottom. I, I've, I've got one where, where Pennsylvania wins. Um, the days of dependence on heavy industry are gone. Um, that's basically a stereotype at this point. Natural gas is a wonderful resource, but we aren't overly dependent on that either. We have a very good base from which to grow in the state, and the industries we need are already here. Uh, to grow faster from that solid base, we have to do three things. We have to keep people in the state. We have to become more attractive to the investors and high earners who bring financial capital. Uh, and we have to try to ensure that childless adults in the state who can realistically work are working. More workers and more capital equals more growth. Uh, when I say people uh, keep people in the state, I'm referring to the fact that in the five years ended to 2017, Pennsylvania had net out-migration of almost 100,000 people, 55 per day, and about two-thirds of those were in the uh, age group 20 to 34. Uh, the educational attainment group with the biggest out-migration were people uh, with a college degree or more. Uh, it's hard to make your state grow faster when the most dynamic slice of your population is leaving. Why is this happening? The reasons why people move, uh, according to surveys, are varied. Uh, they include things that can't be controlled. But we do know something very important about migration in aggregate. A study from the Cato Institute called Tax Reform and Interstate Migration is very much worth a read. It very, it very strongly shows that while there are other moving parts, there's a very clear flow of people from high tax states to low tax states. I won't rehash all the numbers except to say that you know, low tax states have gained people over uh, just about any time frame, recent time frame, high tax states have lost people. Low tax states um, have grown faster, high tax states have grown slower, and hardly any state on a total burden level is a higher tax state than Pennsylvania. The median Pennsylvania household pays 13.8 percent in combined state and local taxes, or about 8,000 per household, uh, and that's according to the Personal Finance Service Wallet Hub. Only uh, Connecticut and Illinois have a higher tax burden according to that methodology, and as this crowd knows, Connecticut and Illinois are not the, the company you want to keep uh, on uh, comparative fiscal metrics. Uh, a lot of the tax burden in Pennsylvania, this group knows, of course, is admittedly at the local level, but it's important to understand that the state personal income tax of 3.07 percent is not as low as it looks. This is because Unlike any other state, Pennsylvania specifies eight different classes of income, and each one is traded separately, and you can't carry losses from one over to the other in order to uh, reduce your liability. This is a direct penalty to people who own a small business or do a lot of financial investing, i.e. exactly the type of people the state needs to retain and attract. The state should collapse these eight classes into one and cut the rate at least down to 2.8 percent, which is where it was before the last hike. Uh, revenue offset could be achieved by broadening the base on the state sales tax, which currently has 23 exemptions. Uh, Health care costs are perhaps an understandable one. Bubble gum, sports tickets are not. It's important to act now on personal taxation um, because of the change in the federal treatment of state and local taxes, obviously no longer deductible uh, above a cap uh, at the federal level, and that has many high earners in places like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, reevaluating their place of res residence. Not everybody wants to go someplace warm. If Pennsylvania were to lower its own state and local tax burden, this is a once in a generation chance to pull a tremendous amount of income and investment capital into the state that is looking to move. The corporate tax rate, as mentioned, at 9.99% is well out of line with the rest of the country. It is the third highest in the nation. In, and even Governor Wolf favors cutting it. In addition to lowering the rates, the state should allow more use of net operating losses, as was already explained. Uh, 
the inability to use losses from bad years to offset your income in good years directly uh, hits capital intensive, high fixed cost businesses, i.e. the kind of um, manufacturing and heavy industry that employs high wage technical labor, which is what we want to attract and keep. Revenue offsets here can come from ending Pennsylvania's 800 million in annual corporate welfare payments, uh, giveaways to private business in order to try to induce them to do this or that thing, to hire more, to innovate more. As I said at the outset, Pennsylvania has the industrial base that it needs. We don't need to bribe corporations to come. Also, it makes a little sense to um, spend a bunch of money to give to this or that favored business when those savings could be used to simply cut the tax burden for everybody. Um, uh, Commonwealth Foundation estimates that by eliminating corporate welfare, we could afford a revenue neutral cut in the corporate tax rate down to perhaps 7%. Uh, another point on the spending side, I mentioned the Taxpayer Protection Act in the morning session as a means to improve budgeting practice and contain spending, but I want to point out here that it's also a growth measure in a sense, uh, in the sense that spending discipline creates the space to cut taxes, uh, which keeps more money in people's pockets. Away from taxes, pursue reg regulatory simplification. The, uh, that statistic that the Pennsylvania Code would take six months uh, to read end to end with no breaks. That comes from the Mercatus Center. And just think of that poor intern who was forced to use their six month internship to read the PA code. Um, tax and regulatory reform together will help uh, retain people and money in the state and if it done right, attract them. We can also unleash more of the human resources we already have and reduce po poverty in the bargain. And we can do that by ensuring that everybody in Pennsylvania who's able to work does work. Uh, about this time last year, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette had a great story uh, called The Vanishing Rural Workforce. And they quoted in that story many employers in West Central PA, many of them offering 15 an hour and up with training and benefits who were having trouble hiring. Strangely, this was happening uh, along with a very high use of, we of welfare and disability benefits by working age men in that same region. Uh, a commentary piece published by one of my colleagues in Investors Business Daily around that same time uh, gave the example of Channel Lock, a fairly well-known uh, U.S. tool brand uh, located in uh, Crawford County. President of that company offers high wages and a training program, and he can't fill vacancies. In light of these situations, it really is tragic when you see uh, the numbers on um, hundreds of thousands of able-bodied, childless Medicare recipients who report no income, or more than 200 people, 1,000 people on food stamps who are not working. This is not to beat up on anyone or, or to, to express an opinion on why this or that group of people is or is not receiving benefits. The point here is that in this economy, the jobs are there, and the measure of a humane uh, social policy is not how many people are using it long term, it's how many people and how easily they can move off of it into work. Um, we think work requirements are a essential part of that, um, but we also uh, think that you know there can't just be rules, there also have to be incentives. Um, benefit cliffs whereby uh, somebody can actually lose his benefits if he takes more hours or get a raise, um, that obviously discourages work, it isn't fair, and, and those should be hunted out in the code and eliminated. Um, as I said at the outset, these are all fairly simple suggestions. Keep people in the state, incentivize work where possible, and uh, give people money by cutting their taxes. And that's our formula for economic growth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, first question goes to Representative Dawn Keeper. I'll try to take this down to one um, question. Uh, just based on all the, the different data and the numbers that you're giving, and we're trying to um, you know, in incentivize businesses to invest in, and locate in Pennsylvania. So one of the big issues that's been belabored, and I know, Jared, this is not, uh, you don't think this is as big of an issue uh, in Pennsylvania, but property taxes. It's just that, that beast that will not go away. And so as we're looking at this comprehensively, and we, we eliminate, let's say we get to a plan that eliminates property taxes, that is a huge um, win for businesses because, uh, you know, they're not going to have to make it up in another way. All the proposals that are out there would be an increased um, personal income tax or earned income tax. Uh, it's on the actual uh, consumer uh, use base kind of taxes. So uh, in light of that, how would you, would you say we should 
eliminate uh, or lower the corporate net income tax or you know how do, how do you offset that if, if they're not going to be paying here but, uh, you know anybody quantify how much that would be to businesses would that be enough of, of an incentive or a win because some of them especially with spot appeals um, I mean this is a huge cost to some businesses if I may yes, Senator um, through the chair um, so Firstly, yes, businesses do pay a significant amount of property taxes. In fact, for businesses that tend to be are headquartered somewhere, it can often be many multiples of their corporate income tax liability. So it's very important to them. Um, they, it, the proposals I've seen, there's a variety of different proposals for reducing or repealing the school property tax. So I don't want to speak of all of them, I'm speaking somewhat generically. Most of those would increase income taxes and sales taxes. You have a lot of business inputs in the sales tax base, so it is worth considering that if you're increasing the sales tax rate, businesses will pay considerably more sales taxes. Uh, it's frequently estimated that around 40% of a, state, a typical state tax base, and I think Pennsylvania is about typical here, is paid by businesses. So that is a countervailing increase to, you know, to the, um, the savings they might be incurring on the property tax. Um, states where there's split role, this would be more beneficial for um, state for businesses to no longer pay it because they're paying much higher rates. You have a uniformity clause, so businesses aren't being you know, double um, you know, hit double here like they would in some states on the property tax. Um, we have expressed concerns in the past simply given the size of the school property tax portion. Uh, Forgive me if I don't have the current estimate, but I believe it's about 15 or $16 billion. Uh, that is a lot of money to replace in other taxes. And um, it also is an unusual shift to go that far. You have high property taxes. I understand trying to address how high they are, and I understand addressing that you have three different levels of government that have property tax authority, which I think probably contributes to the public unrest about property taxes. But especially in this part of the country, it would be highly unusual for schools not to be substantially funded by property taxes. That shifts a little out west where you have a lot of public land and where it's otherwise very difficult to provide adequately for education through property taxes but you would be a marked outlier in at least east of the Mississippi if you took um, a significant portion off the property tax, and I believe alone if you didn't have any school property tax. Uh, so j just some thoughts as you're addressing that. You know, businesses are going to pay somewhere else too. Um, for a panel on rainy day funds, um, we don't really have a constitutional amendment directing this. I'm going to look at some our historian here, uh, Chairman Saylor, on this. But I'm pretty sure the drawdown of the previous rainy day funds, um, statutorily, it's required a, a, a two-thirds vote. In statute, they basically repealed it, and then they spent the money. Um, and I think it was over, was it two, two budgets that basically was a billion? Yeah, billion dollars was gone within two budget cycles. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's there's obviously consensus around um, basing how much you have off volatility, um, looking at um, outside of just a surplus funding, doing something there. But as far as, as, as um, withdrawing the funds, um, should it be a constitutional provision to make sure it's, you know, the, the the kind of legislative gamemanship of, well, we're going to do it anyway, it's just a statute, so we're just going to repeal the statute, spend the money, and then we can always reinstitute our kind of guards. Uh, because we've, even on the putting in the surplus, we've had various, I mean, um, Stan put it up to 100% this year, we've had it at zero, we've had it at 50, we've had it at 25%, so st statutorily, we're very inconsistent with doing that. So kind of constitutional or statutory. And uh, Representative, I can speak, and then Bill hand it over to you. We, um, most states have their funds in statutes, and most states have great withdrawal conditions, but if they're in statute, any state can usually non-withstand any of those rules. There are states that have two-thirds rules, but a simple majority can change any of that. And so um, when we talk to states, and most states, again, have it in statute. When we talk to them, we say constitutional rules are great because you have to follow them. Um, they're not great because you have to follow them, so you better get it right. So in Virginia, they have a withdrawal condition that um, at the time they thought was really smart, and it still is to a lot of degrees, but they had to create a separate statutory fund because their withdrawal condition didn't cover enough. Um, and so I think that flux, when a recession hits, you're going to want that money available. Um, it's obviously a trade-off knowing that 
you might be taking it out in um, times you shouldn't if it is in statute, but that statutory rule does give you a little more flexibility, which you might appreciate. But there's no best practice, there's just differences. I, I would actually <clears throat> I would actually ag agree with that the the advantage of a constitutional provision is it gets public buy-in um, the, the, the disadvantage it, it also may take several years to to enact the, the disadvantage is that uh, what was good then may not be good now and then you have to do a workaround uh, which uh, if you look at if you look at some of the California California fiscal referendums uh, Proposition 13, most notably, uh, constitutional amendment, great, uh, great referendum, you know, ref ballot by uh, government by referendum, it looked great, but it, it entirely changed the, the the state fiscal system. So now the state is the the, the state is the, the major funder of schools rather than localities. Um, Proposition 13. Um, like it or hate it has really turned turned Sacramento into a big um, a, a big money mill. The, the money goes up and, and comes back. It's made California much more reliant on uh, on a steeply progressive income tax. So you have a very small, just a handful of taxpayers paying the bulk of of the revenue. So it puts the entire state at risk. So be, when you're considering a constitutional amendment, uh, be you know be careful what you ask for. Gotcha. And then for withdrawals, um, obviously the goal, uh, I think it was stated earlier in a previous session, most recessions last about two years. So your goal should be drawing down that money over maybe two or three years or four years. You don't want to do it one shot, spend it all, correct? You want to make sure you have a well thought out withdrawal policies. Well, you, you, you know, you can't really, um, it's tough lately to gauge what the next recession will be. The, the last two were, were so different. The, the, t the 2001 recession you know, lasted a few months. Uh, GDP didn't even decline for two quarters in that, in that one. Uh, to the, 2000, the next recession, um, 2008, it, it, the bottom fell out. Uh, states, some states saw their revenues fall by 20% or more. Uh, all, all at once, so it's hard. It's hard to come up with an exact. We want this to last for for two years, three years. Uh, what you want to do is avoid what Alaska did for many years until the money practically ran out. Was uh, start to budget to what your rainy day fund had. Budget for budget for for peaks rather than uh, rather than for um, for minimums. So Alaska for several years. Uh, the legislative analyst will will confirm this for you. Uh, it kind of didn't matter that the budget didn't balance whatever whatever the deficit was, the reserve covered, and this went on in, until one day they're they're out of res they're just about out of reserves. Uh, so you 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 want you really want a rainy day fund to be there for emergencies, um, setting a setting an exact amount. You you don't know you, you don't know what the next recession will be in terms of what t which tax revenues are are hit the most. It may be property taxes, and that will be a local problem. We, we just we don't know. What we do know is that, uh, on average, states, uh, states, state revenue trails the economy by about a year. Um, in some cases, in the last recession, uh, because real estate started collapsing early, a state like Arizona uh, actually saw, they, they saw revenues falling before the country went into recession. Uh, but it's generally about about a year, and the recovery is about a, is about a year. So that's what you should keep in mind. Gotcha. If I could just add, I know that um, the stress test in Utah came up a few times, and not only do they do a great job of figuring out how much recession would cost the state in terms of the gap, but also they do a great job of adding up all their budget buffers beyond rainy day funds to figure out what they could draw down in the sense of a recession. And so there's two lines of thinking. One, we've saved this money up. It should be the first thing that goes out the door. Then we could do the more painful stuff later. But most states and most states have some provision in law that makes it more of a glide path, about half reserves. I know I think S&P has a general framework that they'd like to see half more one-time things like reserves used to cover a gap and half more structural changes, just because you're not sure, as, as Bill said, how long a recession might last.
right. And then for our economic growth um, panel, um, unfortunately in Pennsylvania, when we talk about broad-based tax reform, it's usually at the local level of property taxes. Um, I hear there's maybe more of an interest this fall in actually talking about broad-based taxes. Um, I know AFP, you put out some general guidelines on structuring of that. Obviously, I've been in meetings with Commonwealth Foundation and, and, and Tax Foundation. Obviously, Tax Foundation provided a, a blueprint, a report, a pretty substantial report on, on how, to, how to do it with, with several options. Um, just as we move forward, just any, any cautionary um, suggestions to watch out for? Um, and I know, I, I know one of our sticking points is, is property taxes with any kind of broad-based reform, and I think part of your, your um, recommendations kind of address that, or, which was similar to, to what you presented. But just want to get some, some input into you know, what, what to watch out for and what to protect against to make sure we're, we're doing it right. Well, the uh, general principle, as you know, of a good tax policy is always lowest reasonable rate on the broadest possible base. That's a good maxim to bear in mind. I know that a lot of people uh, in the state policy community like to always say, yeah, well, what about Kansas? They reformed taxes and then they ran out of money. Um, and, and the reason I bring that up is because uh, of the morning panel where we talked about spending discipline. Um, ultimately, the money has to come from somewhere. The, I, my understanding is the, the, the um, you know, state and whether, whether education funding comes in at the local property tax level or at the state level, you know, the, the localities complain that property taxes are, are high because they get unfunded requirements from the state regarding, uh, uh, regarding um, education. So uh, I think the idea of doing it in concert with spending is an important thing to keep in mind. And the, the idea of a total tax burden that gets split one way or another between state and local. I would just add uh, two principles, no net increase in the tax burden. So if we're going to broaden the base and get rid of some of the corporate breaks, let's make sure there's a you know, an, uh, corresponding rate reduction. And then just additionally keeping the legislation clean so that there are no legal challenges would be a wonderful, wonderful way to, to draft this. So, um, and then we just have, you know, the three principles of simple, competitive, and fair. So, and with competitive, we'd like to see that CNIT brought down, and we think that's a real possibility with considering both the executive and the, um, and the legislature. Um, simple, kind of consolidating all of those local taxing authorities so that it's not such an onerous process um, for both individuals and businesses. And then fair, let's just take out some of the, um, some of the kind of cronyistic uh, handouts to certain businesses and uh, you know, level the playing field. If I could just add some concluding thoughts on uh, that, I think some very good points made there. Um, one on bases, because it's a mantra among tax people, and I say it all the time, you know, broad bases and low rates, and this is true. But there are broad bases and then there are overly broad bases. Uh, if you look at a tax expenditure report, I think there's often this temptation to think everything there is fair game and you can look and say, oh, you know, we could increase collections by 70%. What could we do with the rate then? Of course, you really can't because there are incentives in the tax code that you should critically evaluate, whether they're actually achieving their intended purpose. Um, there are, I mean, the, the sales tax here and everywhere else is needlessly narrow because it's really a sales tax that's 80 years out of date and doesn't reflect a modern tech, uh, modern um, you know, society and modern consumption patterns. But that doesn't mean that every expenditure on either of those things is meant to be eliminated. Many of them are structural to make sure that you're not double taxing, that you're not having pyramiding across a production process, that you aren't getting the wrong definition of profits or income. So sometimes you hear, well, let's start almost like zero-based, except not budgeting, instead like a zero-based base reckoning. And that can be like really enticing because you can look and say, oh, we can, we can have a 100% increase in the sales tax base and we can get the sales tax down 50%. No, you can't. You really cannot. Now, there's a lot you can do. Same with the corporate income tax. There's a couple hundred million dollars worth of incentives that should be critically evaluated. I think it's about 300 million a year. That's big. That's, uh, that's a percentage point on your base. And then if you look at some of the other you know, options that Commerce and the governor have, it's maybe even more. 
but you know, it's not five percentage points. It's and on the sales tax, same thing. You want to make sure that you understand the distinction between preferential tax policies that should be critically evaluated and structural provisions that are necessary to actually have a tax on sales rather than gross receipts or on corporate net income rather than some definition of gross income. Uh, those things are very important. And then, um, you know, on you know, this Kansas does always come up. Actually, I've been spending some time in Kansas lately, but this is a broader issue. Firstly. Um, let me get this number. Um, 19 states have cut their individual income tax since 2008. Uh, we hear of Kansas because the other 18 have not had the problems Kansas had. Uh, 16 states have cut their corporate income tax since 2008. Again, we hear of Kansas. We don't hear of the others because it's a unique story. It's a disastrous story, and it is a cautionary tale. We shouldn't just dismiss it. They did a lot of things terribly wrong. They cut $1.1 billion um, in revenue on a $7 billion general fund budget. Now, unless you have a really aggressive cost-cutting plan, that is a crazy thing to do. Uh, and they didn't have one. In fact, they didn't have a single dollar in cost reductions, so they just had a $1.1 billion revenue hole. Uh, that wasn't the original intention. They wanted to actually cut, but how do you cut, you know, 14, 15 percent of your budget? So they didn't do it, and then the governor just said, we'll grow into it. Well, you won't. I believe that there is dynamic feedback effects from tax cuts. Um, they do not replace all of the revenue. And more importantly, businesses care about more than just their tax rates. So they looked at Kansas and said, oh, so the education system's going to crater. You're not going to be able to pave the roads. And eventually, you're going to have to raise the rates again because this isn't sustainable. No business looked at that and said, yeah, we really want that rate cut. There are huge opportunities here, I think, for significant reforms, including rate reductions. You don't follow the path of Kansas because you don't need to or want to. You don't need to go that steep. You need to get into the ballpark of where most other states are. You have a 9.99% corporate rate. The median rate is 6.75. Can you get closer to that? Can you do it by broadening some bases, by having a more equitable tax code? And I think you can very much do that. Terrific. And just to be clear, um, well, aggregate, there may not be a, a necessarily a revenue or a tax increase, but with certain taxpayers, right? I mean, um, you know, and, and it's one of the reforms we have with property taxes. So. Um, um, senior citizen who is renting uh, may not benefit, or anybody renting may not benefit from from a, a shift uh, to income or sales tax versus a homeowner. Same thing can happen with with state tax structures as well. Each person has their own unique yeah. tax base to to, to watch. Yeah. Renters do pay property taxes just indirectly. Um, however rental prices are to some degree sticky. If you took the property tax burden away, I doubt you would see a commensurate dollar for dollar reduction over time. You know, if you look, if you came back five or 10 years later, I imagine that they'd again be, it would be again equalized, but it's not gonna be equalized in the first year, the second, or even the third. So uh, there is a shift um, that's not in renter's favor for at least a few years if you're doing something on property taxes like that. I would that. imagine there, the rent wouldn't go up as much, or maybe wouldn't go up at all, so it would be building over time. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? None. Thank you all for your time today. I uh, appreciate the members' uh, tentativeness in, in, in um, coming to the hearing. We have a wealth of information, which I think there are great points between each of the uh, testifiers today that I think we can build upon in Pennsylvania to improve our financial management and become a, a much stronger state financially and economically.